First announced by video game composer Tommy Tallarico in 2018, the Intellivision Amico was to be a family-friendly console with affordable games, free of swearing and violence, and no predatory sales practices like microtransactions. The company had success with an early fundraising campaign, and while I wasn't personally interested in the system, I could imagine it carving out a small niche of fans. However, following three years of mismanagement and constant lying to investors and consumers, the Intellivision Amico is now almost certainly doomed to failure. Intellivision is on its fourth crowdfunding campaign, which, even if successful, will only tide it over for six months. The project is beginning to feel like a scam. That may be harsh, but I don't know what else to call the latest attempt to raise money with a pitch filled with lies and misleading statements. Whatever you want to call it, I strongly advise you to stay well clear. Obviously this isn't the usual type of content I put out on this channel, however the former lawyer and accountant in me couldn't resist digging into this mess. The original Intellivision, a portmanteau of intelligent television, was a home console first released in 1979 with a couple of subsequent iterations. It sold over 3 million units in its first four years but struggled against the Atari 2600 and in the video game crash of the 80s. And that was pretty much it until 2018 when Tommy Tallarico bought Intellivision Productions, which held the Intellivision IP, and announced his plans for a modern system dubbed Intellivision Amico. From day one, Intellivision made it clear the console was targeted at families with young children, from the acronym SAFE for Simple Affordable Family Entertainment, to the maximum age rating for games of E10+. Games would be cheap, initially up to $8, although the cap is now at $10 for digital and $20 for physical, and that is set to go up again. DLC and microtransactions are banned. All games have to be unique to the Amico. Tallarico claimed modern controllers were too complicated, so the Amico controller has a touchscreen with a wheel and shoulder buttons designed for ease of use, even by those not familiar with gaming. Basically, he wants to replicate the success of the Wii. All this sounds nice in theory, but the Amico is always going to be a tough sell. The messaging has been remarkably out of touch with common sense knowledge about the video game marketplace. I didn't make this video to bash the project as a whole, but it's important to show just how detached from reality Tallarico and his team have been from the start. For example, the fundraising campaigns are dripping with more boomer energy than a Facebook anti-vax group. If I dare complain about the price point, I'll probably get told to cut back on the avocado toast. And that price point. It was $250, which was bad enough, but the range now goes up to $350, which is more than the Xbox Series S or a Switch, and just $50 less than a digital PS5. The videos include hilarious clips depicting modern gaming as a dark and solitary activity that is tearing families apart. You'll be shocked to hear that some teenagers are apparently spending time away from their parents and with their friends instead. Some even wear headphones and rooms full of laughter were replaced by insulating headsets. Boomer! There's a baffling picture of old consoles presented as complicated compared to the simplicity of the Abico. This one cracks me up, like what are they trying to say with this image? Why compare it to old consoles for a start? Isn't the point that modern gaming is bad and old gaming was good? And if you do want to compare to old consoles, why not show all the wires and remind people how messy it was? This image just makes me want to get my Sega Mega Drive out. The advertising makes a big deal about how there are more than 3 billion gamers, which is basically just them counting everyone with a smartphone. Imagine trying to pitch a movie and leading with 5 billion people watch movies, we're going to make a fortune. That's basically what Intellivision is doing. And has anyone on this all-male team ever met a child? Like Kids quickly get to grips with controllers, and if the family can afford a $350 novelty console, they can certainly afford a cheap tablet or a phone for the kid to mess around with. And that's if you can drag the kid away from Roblox or Minecraft. Kids aren't idiots. They're annoying, but they aren't idiots. I'm also not sure how Intellivision expects to get devs on board to make unique games for a system that even in Tallarico's wildest dreams will have a small user base, and caps the price at $10. And did the Ouya just not happen to these people? And that system was cheap. But yeah, having a bad business model doomed to failure is not something worthy of investigation or being called a scam. The very channel you're watching this video on is a failed business, but it's not a scam. The problem comes when you continuously lie while asking for money. I'm not going to list every inconsistency and inaccuracy relating to this project. Plans change, prices increase, ideas have to be cut, pandemics happen, etc. It's not all dodgy and worthy of warning or ridicule. I'll stick to the more blatant lies and general mismanagement. As always, I like to kick things off with a little light fraud. Intellivision Entertainment has long touted its Karma gaming engine, which it claims adjusts game difficulty on the fly. This was mentioned during the first fundraising campaign on Fig and is still mentioned in 2022's fundraising campaign. 
This sounds a little odd, right? Like, not the concept of adjusting difficulty as such, but the fact that it's seemingly built into the console firmware. Well, it's a lie. While official materials mention the Karma Gaming Engine as a real thing, Tommy Tallarico has gone on record many times in random interviews and streams admitting, even boasting, weirdly, that the Karma Gaming Engine is just a marketing term, like Sega's infamous blast processing on the Genesis slash Mega Drive. The gaming engine is like Sega's blast processing. So it's it's just a marketing term. <laughs> blast processing. It's not like a real like hardware thing or anything. We call it the Karma Gaming Engine. So, you know, it's it's not really an engine per se. It's more like a philosophy. It's not real a physical engine or anything like that or a you know proprietary whatever. It's it's just it's a way of thinking. The Karma Gaming Engine. Yeah, it's yeah. not really an yeah, engine. Yeah philosophy it's like blast processing uh, on, on, the, on the mega drive right this is interesting first of all blast processing was technically a real thing it essentially added a bunch more available colors by blasting the processor however it couldn't be used not with regular cartridge games at least because if it was used it would take up all the console's processing power with nothing left to run the game but it was real the karma gaming engine is apparently not despite it being described in investor materials even worse, Intellivision Entertainment continues to describe the Karma Gaming Engine as a patented system. It's not. I mean, you can't really patent something that doesn't exist, right? Or can you? Because in January 2022, Intellivision did file a patent application which includes an adaptive difficulty system. So is it real now? And if it is, why would Tallarico say it's not? This engine, or whatever you want to call it, looks basic and I'm not convinced it's patentable, but I'm not an IP expert or a programmer proprietary whatever anyway you probably shouldn't describe a system as being patented in an investor presentation when you don't have a patent yet but it gets even worse in television entertainment received a grant of 450,000 euros from the film commission by a bavarian entity that seems to be at least partially funded by the local government the grant specifically describes the karma system as being under patent so in television must have told the commission that it had a patent for the karma gaming system which means it basically lied to the bavarian government to get a grant I suppose it's possible that there was a misunderstanding during the application, possibly a translation issue, but frankly, most Germans speak better English than what I do, so I doubt it. We just call it the Karma Gaming Engine because it sounds cool. The next thing isn't so much a lie as it is highly misleading. Intellivision claims to have over $25 million in pre-orders and directs. We know there is just over $7 million in pre-orders through FIG, but it appears the rest of this number is merely declared interest from retailers such as GameStop and Amazon. I highly doubt those companies have committed to purchase any units, and I certainly don't see any commitments in the latest available balance sheet. Intellivision lost $1.3 million through a manufacturing deal gone wrong. The money is still listed as an asset at the end of 2020, although a note in the SEC disclosure, which was so important it apparently had to be mentioned twice, makes it clear that the money is probably gone. This disclosure is full of typos, by the way. I'm probably biased here, but seriously, don't skimp on legal fees when you're making an SEC disclosure. Like, this is not the place to cut corners. The SEC has already given Intellivision a slap on the wrist related to the hiring of Jay Allard. Allard joined as Global Managing Director in May 2020. As an Xbox co-founder, he added a sheen of legitimacy to the project. Or at least he would have done if he hadn't taken one look around and bailed. His prompt exit made the project look worse than if he had never joined in the first place. After Allard left, Tallarico continued touting Allard as an employee during an earnings call, so the SEC had to write a letter demanding clarification. Speaking of Tallarico, he's not exactly the epitome of strong leadership and often spends so much time arguing on Twitter and internet forums such as Atari Age that you have to wonder if he's doing any work at all. He constantly attacks critics, calling them everything from morons to gaming racists, and at one point was following the likes of actual racists like The Quartering on Twitter. Atari Age ended up shutting its Amico thread due to all the drama. When Ars Technica published a piece about the Amico based on information in an unprotected developer portal, Tallarico went on a Twitter rant threatening to sue Ars Technica for breach of intellectual property because the materials had confidential written on them. Tallarico has now been replaced as CEO by Phil Adam, who, if you're curious, was part of the Coleco Chameleon team. The Coleco Chameleon was another retro game console that never made it to market and also employed somewhat dubious marketing tactics. I don't know if Adam had a big role on that project, but it doesn't exactly look good. Tallarico still has an executive role and is so confident in the success of the Amico project that he's going on tour with his band in April. Crucial parts of Intellivision's business model change on a regular basis, although these changes are often kept out of official materials and just casually mentioned in interviews. 
Initially in television planned to take a whopping 50% from every game sale, although they now say this is not fixed. Phil Adam recently said that the $10 limit on game prices is going away. And we're putting more money into the content, the software than originally planned. And, and the price will go up. It's not going to go up 500%. It's not going to be $50, but it's going to go up 50 to 100% in some cases. And the products we ship day one will be $9.99 digitally. Uh, but uh, you'll see some licensed titles and others that are higher in what we consider AAA titles, which we will have some. Talarico made a huge deal about having original games, but it now seems to be settling for ports. They've even started talking about putting their games on other platforms, which strongly suggests they know the Amico is doomed and just want to get some dev costs back on the games. In television, sales pitch states that other gaming consoles cost upwards of $500. No console costs over $500. The PS5 Disc Edition and Xbox Series X are $500, but there are cheaper versions of both available. Someone called in television out on this, and the response was that those systems would be over $500 if they included six games like the Intellivision does. But come on, who do they think they're fooling with this? I was going to ask a few questions myself, but they are now asking for people to provide LinkedIn credentials if they don't like your tone. And people have already asked the pertinent questions, Intellivision just chooses not to answer anything beyond softball stuff. There's no concrete information on how much each console costs to make. Ars Technica did a parts breakdown and put it in the sub $100 region. The tech specs suggest the console was on par with a mediocre Android phone from about 2016, so it's not exactly a powerhouse. Intellivision has refuted the claim that the consoles cost less than $100 to make, saying that the cost is nowhere near that low. I get why Intellivision felt the need to say this because it doesn't want to look like it's making too much profit on the consoles, but from an investor perspective that's obviously bad, and it suggests the company is perhaps overpaying on parts, or at least not getting the sort of deals you might expect. On a more minor note, Intellivision is selling physical copies of games to collectors, except there's no physical game in the box. It's a piece of plastic you tap against your console to initiate a software download. This is one of those things that's just a bit scummy and not outright duplicitous. Intellivision knows full well that people buy physical games for preservation purposes, especially people buying retro-style consoles. They don't want what is essentially a download code for a system that is likely to have a lifespan shorter than the amount of time it takes to download a game. And it's not like this is a situation where the game can't fit on the disc. Interestingly, Talarico claims these games are NFTs. It's an RFID card that is also an NFT. That means this is tracked in the blockchain, this specific individual card. So we can register it through the Amico and who is the owner becomes registered in the blockchain. The cool thing about that is you can transfer ownership as well from one Amico to another. Exactly. So you're not like, it's not like you're downloading it and then, you know, you're stuck forever. These are transferable. Now, I hate NFTs because they are a blatant scam. But if what Talarico says here is true, it might be the one acceptable use of them because you could, in theory, sell your digital games. Of course, that's a massive if because you can't trust anything he says at this point. And it doesn't sound like he really understands what NFTs are. Or maybe it's just me who doesn't. He says all the games have been put on the blockchain, but I'm fairly sure that involves spending crypto, which immediately makes this a financial loss. Speaking of those games, Tank Battle, a game in television has heavily promoted, was caught using assets stripped from World of Tanks. There's also been a lot of iffy marketing that leads a bad taste in the mouth, like the photos of people holding the controllers, which are actually edited stock photos. Talarico once again went after Ars Technica for having the tenacity to point this out, and okay, while he's right that this is what stock photos are for, that's not what bothers me. These photos were included in a 2021 E3 presentation. At this stage, in television had video footage of people using the controllers, and that was included in the video. Why not maybe take some photos of those people? Why bother editing stock photos? It's just weird and shows an inattention to detail. In television often quotes people out of context, so if I were to say, I don't think the Amico is going to be a huge success, there's a chance you could see them quote me as saying, the Amico is going to be a huge success. There are interviews with supposedly random people talking about how much they love the system, but they are the most obvious plants I've ever seen. It's really a lot better than I expected. I love it, the controller is fantastic, uh, the motions are great, very smooth, the gameplay is fun, I like the graphics. I love it. The Amico system's great. I love the fact that it's a very family-friendly game. Anyone can come to this and just sit down and start playing, and frankly, that's the way video games should be. It is going to fly off the shelves. This does happen in advertising, but this feels more misleading than your typical advert where you sort of expect it. 
And with those games, Intellivision really doesn't want you to see them running, especially how the controller interacts with what's on screen. I heard reports of input lag, so I went looking for footage and found very little that proves it either way. Most promotional footage tries to hide the problem. For example, during a presentation of Tank Battle, there's minimal footage of the controller and game on screen in one shot. And at one point, just as Talarika goes to press the fire button, the shot cuts the picture in picture, which may not be properly synced up, so you can't see if there was lag. I found one shot that didn't cut away and it did look like there was significant lag. Maybe the tanks are just slow to fire? To be fair, there are a few short clips of other games where lag is minimal enough to not be a huge concern, so maybe it's just that one game or it was the environment they were testing in. And the touchscreen, by the way, doesn't look great. When talking about Astro Smash, Talarico excitedly talks about different colour ships to choose from, but they all look the same colour on the touchscreen. Now you'll notice the four ships are four different colors. You got red, blue, purple, and green. So depending on what ship I pick, I'm gonna pick the red ship right here. Now watch my disc light up, boom, because I'm the red ship. The red ship comes down. I'll leave you to make your own mind up about the games from the video footage. I wouldn't get too excited for big name titles like Earthworm Jim though. So far the only footage we have of this game is the titular Earthworm running briefly to the left and then to the right for about 10 seconds. In television entertainment's lies and misleading comments are important because the company has received millions of dollars in funding from the general public and investors and is looking for millions more. The first campaign on FIG raised $7.1 million via what were essentially pre-orders. There was a campaign on Fundable, but this is private so we have no idea how much was raised. The SEC filing doesn't mention this at all, so just think of a really low number and then halve it and you might be close to how much this campaign generated. The next one is interesting. Via Republic, which now owns FIG, Intellivision raised a whopping $11.6 million in April 2021. It was over $13 million at one point by the sounds of it, so it appears some investors pulled out. That's a lot of money, which you might think would tide them over for a bit. Why would they need a fourth round nine months later? Well, I don't think they've received all that money, or even most of it. Maybe any of it. This one requires a deeper dive. Now, usually when we think of crowdfunding, we think of the likes of Kickstarter and even Intellivision's earlier FIG round, which are essentially pre-order programs. However, following the SEC's eventual implementation of the Jobs Act, companies can now crowdfund via stock issuances. Investors get a stake in the business instead of just a product. However, in this case, investors aren't putting their money directly into Intellivision. Instead, investors receive special shares in FIG Publishing Inc. called FIG Gaming Shares Dash Amico. Essentially, FIG Publishing issues a different class of stock for every investment on its platform. The idea is that Fig Publishing then invests in Intellivision with the money from that stock issuance, but it's under no obligation to simply pass all the investor money to Intellivision. In fact, it can't. Fig Publishing is a company like any other and has a board with fiduciary duties towards its shareholders. Fig Publishing needs to do due diligence before investing in Intellivision to ensure the money will be used as promised and that there is a reasonable chance of return for its shareholders. And I'm sure they'll charge a generous management fee for the privilege. The Intellivision accounts for the year ended December 31st, 2020 do not mention a specific amount forthcoming from Fig Publishing. While the accounts are for the period before this money was raised, they weren't signed until December 2021, and you'd absolutely expect such a large incoming cash flow item to be mentioned in a note, especially given that the auditors have expressed going concern issues. Similarly, the SEC filing doesn't specify how much money the company will get or has already received from the Fig Publishing relationship. The fact that no numbers are given makes me suspect no money is forthcoming, but where it gets really crazy is that the opposite could be true and that could be just as bad. You see, this deal through Republic is terrible. It's so bad that even if the company had just been given, say, $10 million through Fig Publishing, Intellivision might want to keep that secret so as not to scare off the future investors it now seeks. The conditions of the Fig Publishing investment state that Intellivision must give a revenue share of every hardware and software sale until investors have been paid back three times their investment and then for two years after that point. These revenue splits can be as high as 15% on hardware and 25% on software. Remember how Adam said game prices are going to have to go up? Well, this might be why. At best, these percentages destroy profit margins. At worst, they make every sale into a loss. Intellivision could end up paying $35 million to Fig Publishing just to get the reduced rates, which would last for another two years. Any sane investor would run a mile from this. So yeah, it's possible Intellivision hasn't received any of the Republic money, or it's received all of it and neither answer is actually good. And now we get to the fourth round of fundraising, this time via Start Engine. 
In television entertainment is seeking direct investment now, which might suggest it didn't like the outcome from the intermediary experience with Fig Publishing. Intellivision is now issuing its own stock, so it had to file with the SEC, which is why we now have a lot of information about the company. As an aside, Intellivision formed a Delaware C Corp for this funding, which is not unusual nor suspicious. While the Ars Technica reporting has generally been excellent, I do want to correct part of this article, which suggests the incorporation may have been for tax reasons. It's not. If Intellivision still has a physical presence in California, California will get its cut, don't you worry about that. Investors are just more comfortable investing in Delaware corporations as opposed to California LLCs. Now, Intellivision is seeking $5 million. At the time of writing, it has under $70,000. The SEC filing outright admits that even if it gets the entire $5 million, which looks incredibly unlikely, it will have to raise another $5 million in a few months just to make it to the end of the year. You have to be a bit careful when reading these SEC filings because companies are encouraged to list all possible risk factors and they tend to go a bit overboard and err on the side of caution. That's what Intellivision did. Actually, if I were a sceptical man, I'd say it's thrown loads of unnecessary risk factors in here to try and obfuscate the important ones. For example, many of the risks just essentially say we need to comply with the law, although I suppose it's equally likely this was not deliberate and just a result of doing the filing on the cheap. Anyway, there are a few nuggets in here worth looking at, mainly the intended use of the funds. It's incorrectly worded, but what I think they're saying is if it raises up to $5 million, it will spend 32% on the back end and optimization of the firmware, so potentially $1.6 million. This sure sounds like the storefront is nowhere near ready. I've seen people throw around the $8.7 million figure for debt, I don't think it's quite that bad. Most of this appears to be the prepayments for the consoles if I'm reading it correctly. I've not done accounting for like 12 years now so I may be a bit rusty. This amount will be paid off by delivering the pre-ordered consoles. I'd be more concerned about the short term debt which at the end of 2020 at least way exceeded short term assets. Intellivision is struggling to pay its employees and business partners. Speaking of debt though, we really do need to take a look at some of these loans because there's a real problem in there. It's tempting to dramatise the loans from board members like Talarico, but these types of loans are not uncommon and don't necessarily indicate a lack of faith in the company or anything nefarious. I mean, they also probably do, but it's common and not the big issue here. Interest on loans is tax deductible for the company, so it can be preferable to take on debt over equity. However, there is one loan that stands out. Sudesh Agarwal, or possibly Agarawal, it's written two different ways, loaned the company $650,000 with a loan fee of over $200,000. That's an insanely high loan fee, which I would take issue with if it weren't for the even worse part, the repayment terms. Intellivision must repay Agarwal $100 of this loan for every console sold. $100! That is nearly 30% of the $350 retail price. And bear in mind the original retail price was $250. It would have been 40% at that rate. If you're wondering why the price has gone up by $100, there you go. And I cannot express enough how bad this loan is and how desperate Intellivision must have been to sign it. This is genuinely the worst loan term I've ever seen and it may contribute to the death of this company. To be clear, it's not unheard of to have loans repaid via a percentage of gross sales. The Shark Tank guys love to do this, but the premise of that show is investors offering desperate people money at extortionate rates. And even on there, the rate is more like 5%. The $100 term is so bad that it's arguably not even good from the point of view of the lender because he's far less likely to get that loan repaid at all with a $350 price tag on the consoles, which of course is why the loan fee was so high. Now this $100 per console payment is not the only amount in television has to pay in lenders and investors. There's also that fig publishing deal which could take 15%. We don't know exactly how these numbers will be calculated, so I don't want to be too specific. For example, does revenue include the cut taken by storefronts and payment processors? But even being cautious and assuming a $350 price, it's hard to see how Intellivision makes much, if any, profit on early sales. $350, less $100, less $50 to fig, less delivery charges and payment processing, less cost of goods sold, which we know is significantly higher than $100, well, I think they'd be lucky to make any money, and that's assuming anyone buys these things at $350. And don't forget, Intellivision has already committed to selling thousands of systems at $250. It's possible those are now being sold at a loss, although perhaps the $100 repayment isn't due on those sales. And this could be why the accounts classify that as a prepayment on development and not as a pre-order. Believe it or not, I do feel sorry for Intellivision and those working there. Well, most of them anyway. I don't like to see businesses fail, and it's clear some minority of people would have had fun playing these games. However, the Amico is doomed and I really want people to be on full alert before investing or pre-ordering one of these systems. Intellivision hasn't finished the back end of the storefront and I'm not convinced the onboard software has done either. 
There don't seem to be manufacturing deals in place. There's barely enough money to make payroll, and even if by some miracle it hits the $5 million fundraising goal, that won't be anywhere near enough to get to the end of the year. And yet Intellivision is still accepting pre-orders and is slow to correct its lies and misleading statements, even when pulled up on them. This is where the whole thing starts transitioning from failed business to outright scam in my book. The best case scenario as I see it is that Intellivision manufactures just enough consoles to satisfy pre-orders and ships them out with the promised pack-in games. Maybe it gets a storefront up and running to let customers download the physical games they've already purchased, but I doubt even that. There's a very real chance that customers will have paid $250 for a console with laggy controllers and six packing games that they could probably play in their browser, let alone phone or tablet. And the only consolation will be that at least they didn't pay $350 instead. Consider yourself warned.